Automate the boring stuff with Python. This is the second class. We left off in flow control. Now when we left off in flow control, uh, we had covered some of the basics of flow control, including uh, some operators and comparisons that are necessary, because flow control is mostly controlled through Boolean expressions. These are expressions that will evol uh, evaluate out to true or false. Um, but however, there are some flow control uh, expressions that don't evaluate to, to Booleans. And just to recap a little bit, uh, Boolean expressions can be combined with the AND and the OR operator in order to do compound Boolean expressions. And did anybody get lost in that? Did anybody not get lost in that? Okay, good. I saw some confirmation back. You're awake. Good. Um, so uh, once they evaluate out, of course, you can use the not operator. Two not operators in a row should return back the same thing before because there's only two values in Boolean. If you say it's not false, it must be true. And if it's not that, it must be false again. So breezing through this as fast as we can because uh, we do have a couple of new chapters to cover. In program execution, there's this thing called flow. And program flow, um, I've given classes on just it alone, is how you read the text of your program, which you know has some sort of you know entry point and various lines of code. And you decide and rationalize how you're going to move between these different lines of code. Alright? Sometimes that flow consists of things that look like loops where you enter a loop and you may go through the loop multiple times before exiting the loop. Now the way that this actually works is there's a block of code that you will, ex uh, that you will execute as long as the loop conditional remains true or iterates over particular values or whatever it is that it is doing. So a good example of um, looping flow control, well, of course, I started with loops when I should have started with if else. One of the uh, examples is you could have a statement here. And while that statement is true, you execute block A. And if that statement is false, you execute block B. OK? So this means that even though you've got two different blocks of code up on your screen, you're only going to run one in an if statement. And so like, if you use flow control diagrams, which people haven't used in forever, it will look something like this, where the two flows join back up. And you'll have A over here if it's true. And if the uh, question over here is false, then you'll execute through B. And this is a standard if else statement as shown right here. So if the password is swordfish, then you flow through this first block, access granted. Otherwise, you flow through the second block, wrong password. And uh, just in case you're confused, the password swordfish is always the wrong password because it's a dictionary word and you should never use it. OK, so um, program execution, you start off at the top. You start moving down if statements. We just covered them very quickly. Has anybody had any challenges with if statements? OK, does everybody love if statements and know how to do them exactly? Good, my audience is still away. OK, so here is a flow control block for, um, boy, that jumps nicely. Here's a flow control block. Dude, I've got to be careful here. All right. Oh my gosh, this is going to be fun. So here's a flow control block for an if statement. And so basically, if the name was Alice, then we print hi Alice, and we join back down at the end. Now this is a compound if statement. So what we have is we have an if statement that also has a second conditional here. And so this is an if else if. Now, 
there have been arguments on how to decide how to do uh, various extra checks inside multiple if conditions. Python uses ELIF. So this means if this first thing evaluates out to true, we will execute the block at line four. If the second thing evaluates to true, we will execute the block at line six. And Python denotes its blocks, as we've mentioned before, through indentation. The indentation, it doesn't matter what you with, indent with, as long as it's consistent. If you use different characters to indent, even if it appears to be at the same level, Python will not recognize these as unified blocks. Okay, so here is a many different condition, if, else, if, else, if, else, if statement. There is no check inside the else ifs to make sure that you can reach every one of them. You could do something like if the name is Alice and then if the name is not Alice and then else if something else and the name's either going to be Alice or it's not going to be Alice and so you'd never actually reach the third else if statement. So when you start structuring really deep long else if statements this might be an indication that you will have code that will be harder to maintain over time. This is the flow control for that block above. You can see that it has... Yeah, I love this. I'll have to figure out a better scrolling solution. You can see that in this case they just keep chaining the false down and they go through the true. And then finally, um, you can take a look and here is a relatively uh, simple if statement. It shows that this basically performs the block underneath at once because this would hopefully evaluate out to true. But if you go to these, this while statement, it's a little bit different. And the difference is, is that after it runs this block here, it is going to go back and reevaluate the conditional. And for as long as that conditional, this portion behind the wall, remains true, it will keep reevaluating that block. In some cases, this could make your program never terminate. So you always want to make sure that when you're using a wall statement, that you have some sort of reasonable way to exit this block. Otherwise, you could get a program that just runs forever. Now, occasionally, you do want something that never terminates. For example, if you're writing a server and you want to listen for information on a network socket, it might be appropriate to never terminate your listening loop. But for most programs that you're going to be writing, you want to be careful not to write a while loop that stays running for forever. And you can Could see you? that the uh, primary difference... Yeah, yeah. Yes. Are there some... You a while loop that never runs, is there a it is type possible. Of easy test to check your code and make sure that's not happening? So when you say never runs, or, or, I or, typically or, think or of stop. the block under the while loop is never executed. Okay? But it and that would happen if this condition was never true. Okay? But if this condition is say like spam is less than five. All right. In this case, they are incrementing spam. So either spam started off greater than five, in which case this block never ran, or spam started off, as you can see at line one, zero, and this loop will run five times. Now, if you, for example, changed this top line to where spam was three, then the loop would only execute twice. Right. Okay, but the point is, is that by having it a check against an upper value and then making sure that spam is always growing, they have protected their programming against an infinite loop here. And so this is an indication of what the flow control would look like if it were an if statement, as the first example showed. But you see that the difference between the while loop and the if statement is that the while loop, after it runs through the block, it returns back to the condition 
checks the condition again, and if that condition is true, it will just keep repeating the block under it. But at the moment in time this condition returns false, then it moves on to the code below it. And in this case, the code below it would be shown by basically not being indented. Okay, so right here, this line would execute after the entirety of this while statement had completed. And, it, and so, you know, if I checked to say print out the value of spam right here, then that value would be 5, or perhaps larger if spam was set to something larger up here. And then spam would be set to 1. But if I were to print this value out over here, then we would actually see spam crawling up to 5 until this condition became false. So the blocks that are um, uh, the indentation shown on line 6 are not considered part of the while statement. They are considered the next statement that comes after the while statement. And one thing that flow control kind of glosses over is that the basic flow control is that you execute your statements generally from the top down unless you have a special keyword or construct that changes the flow control. For if statements, we saw this allows us to execute blocks conditionally, while statements allow us to execute blocks repetitively. Would well, the, the while loop, while it's being run, nothing else in the program runs except that block of code within the while statement? And the conditional. And when you say nothing else, it's a little bit vague. The Python interpreter that is working on the Python code is, of course, running because it's evaluating out the commands. And there are other utilities that may be running, too, okay, that are hidden behind the scenes. But from the point of view of the program that you're writing, you can basically say that nothing else is running. Okay, so here we are, and in this case, he's showing us a different kind of while loop, all right? And so he's basically said that he's initializing name to the uh, empty string, the string of no length, and then while the name is not your name, and this in case is the actual string with the text your name in it, this is not your personal name, then it's a please type your name, and it uses this function called input to read information from the console. Who has used input? Awesome. Okay? And it will store whatever you type into the variable name, but you'll notice that when it does that, it hits the end of the block under the control of the while loop. So it goes back up to the while loop and rechecks the value at name against your name. All right? And it stays stuck in this loop until someone types in your space name and presses enter. In this case, this conditional will then evaluate out to be false because your name is your name and that means that not equals won't evaluate to be true. And then it'll print thank you. All right, and so this is an interesting way of basically controlling the flow based off of user input. Sometimes the flow is something that's really easy to do. Okay, like there are some me messaging protocols. You send a certain number of messages, you get a certain number of responses, and the format is relatively uniform. But sometimes the flow is going to be dependent upon stuff that you actually have and prompt uh, your users. And so this is an example of flow control where no matter how often you read the source code of this program, you won't actually know how many times the loop runs because the control 
happens at runtime. It depends. If they type in your name the first time, the loop will run once. If they type in your name the fifth time, the loop will run five times. And again, it still has the same telltale flow of a loop, where you can see that the same condition is being checked repeatedly until it goes false, and then you move to the block underneath it. It's a little typo up in the corner, right? <coughs> where, where it says name equals. Uh, it's not a typo. It's just that they are using single quotes to represent the string. Okay. And you don't, you it formats very badly, because if you're used to using double quotes, you'll be like, oh, <coughs> they forgot the closing double quotes. But in this case, they were using single quotes, and so it just looks like a typo. Can, can you do that? If you have, if you want to say empty string, you can use the quotes of JSON like that? Yes, but they, they are actually two single quote characters. It is yeah. not the same thing no, as no, typing the right, double right. quote. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. yeah. I know, it looks so much like a typo, but fortunately they give you a hint when they do the other string comparisons down below. And so here's an example of how that program might <coughs> run out. You see, please type your name, and obviously this person has a name of Al, and then it'll say, please type your name, and they'll say Albert, and then say, please type your name, and then they uh, type in a nice little explicative there, and then they please type your name, and they finally say your name, and they exit. And uh, humor like that is, inundated in Python programming because Python comes from a history of being named after Monty Python's Flying Circus. So in this case they meant it literally, type your name. So break statements are interesting because break statements, when they encounter, when you encounter a break statement, it changes the flow. We had talked about flow see if there's an eraser. So we talked about flow of loops. And in the flow of a loop, that block, so here's our loop. Okay, and it's got the condition. And it's got a block underneath it. And so if we take a look at our conceptualized flow, here we check our condition, and while it's yes, we run through that block, and then we return back, and if it's no, then we move on to the next statement, which will be a little bit indented, in, well, it'll be indented in line with the loop. Okay? So here's the condition. Now, when you have a looping statement, there are times where it is desirable to not finish the loop. Okay? And so Python and other programming languages provide an escape out of the loop to the line that's below it. And this is called break. It's controlled through a Python keyword. This is not a variable. And so you say break. And so if you say break, inside a looping block. You will exit the loop at wherever you are inside the loop and go to the next statement after the loop. Now if you have multiple loops, like a loop inside of a loop, it happens. It's not the best programming approach for a lot of problems, but the thing is, is that a lot of problems are simple and it's not going to be a problem. Uh, it's not going to cause extra complications. So you might put a loop inside a loop. A good example is if you had something that you wanted that's two-dimensional and you want to like walk each row and then after you're done with a row you want to walk each uh, column or vice versa. Then you might be tempted to make a loop to walk the row. So while we still are checking our rows, then you do check the columns and then you would do something on each cell. All right? Occasionally, you don't want to finish this. 
especially if you're just searching for a particular element inside this theoretical row and column value score that you've got. All right? So inside that cell, you might say break. When you say break in this context, all right, there is an ambiguity. You might be meaning leave the column walking loop. You might also be meaning yeah, leave I, the row walking loop. Yeah. Okay? Now, would you need two different breaks at that point? Well, that would be one way of handling it. How but does it know not to jump all the way up the while and only jump up to print? Okay, um, so when you say only jump up to print, that's not what break does in this context. No, I don't. Break it's jumps. Time. Break jumps to the line six print, not the line two print. Yeah, so it doesn't jump up to print. It jumps so down. It, it doesn't just break the print block, it breaks the while block. Right, because you see the if statement is not a loop. The if statement is a choice. If this condition is true, then execute this block. It doesn't know what's in the block. When it starts executing the block, it hits a break, and this break will associate itself with the loop that it's hey. under. Uh -huh. Okay? So here you can see, here is our loop as represented above, and when it gets down to this if statement, it hits the break which will cause the flow to transition to the print outside the loop. Now when you have more than one loop, you can actually control which one you break out of. All right? And we'll get into this in a later uh, episode when we start talking about labeling your jump points when you talk about breaking out. But the point is, is that for right now, all you need to know is that when you do have two while loops nested, the break will just break out of the lower one, unless you do something special. Continue statements are almost like breaks. They also change the flow of these while loops, but what they do is they change the flow in a different way. So a break statement did what? It took us outside of the loop, right? A continue statement will take us back to the condition being checked. So here's our no out, here's our yes, and here's our entry into the, the condition. And here's our end of the block going back to this condition being checked, all right? But a continuous statement will basically say something like, and then at this point, also go back to the condition being checked. So you don't have to finish your block. Uh, it may sound a little strange, but some programming uh, problems, people will just say, you know, I want to stay inside this loop, but due to the data being a little bit different this time through the loop, I don't actually want to perform the whole block. Okay, an example is if you were like entering in uh, names. Believe it or not, there are people who do not have surnames, and sometimes, more commonly, there are people who do not have given names, the first name or the last name, all right? If you were, say, processing somebody, who didn't have a last name, you would not need to add them to a last name index in a phone book. You would have to only add them to like a first name index in a phone book. And so if they don't have a last name, you might say continue to the next record while you have records to add to this fictitious phone book. All right, whereas you would 
normally have a block that would say, okay, add it to the, you know, the first name index and then add it to the last name index. And, but you might put a little if statement here. If they don't have one, then just skip through and go to the next record. That's kind of a cooked example, but the point is, is that these things can be useful. And so here, we have the actual example provided. Who are you? And while they're typing in, if the name is not Joe, then they continue back to the who are you. Continue will always place you back to evaluating your condition which will eventually place you back into your block if your conditional returns true. So here, if they don't type Joe, they never get past this line. But assuming that they do type Joe, then it says, hello Joe, what is the password? And then he asks the input, and if the password happens to be swordfish, then it breaks. Now remember, breaking is not like continue. It does not take you back up to the condition for evaluation. And this one's going to evaluate very quickly because it's always going to be a true condition. So this break will take us past the entire while loop flow construct and drop us to access granted. Okay. As silly as this is, this is not the way you write login code. But the point is, is that it does use the login idea that people are used to in order to demonstrate flow control. In this case, this would only accept Joe and only accept Swordfish and then would drop you to access granted and everybody else would be caught typing in forever into this loop until they guess Joe and Swordfish. All right, and so this is, an, uh, this is a diagram showing how this continue works. When they hit that if statement, remember if's a choice in the flow, if this if statement evaluates to true, then the continue will take you back to the condition of the loop. But if it evaluates to false, and then it will take you down to the next lines in the block. Okay, and once you get down here, they have another condition. The break will take you out, whereas the false will take you back to the condition. So, Ed? Yes? So, if after the password was written correctly, if you don't say break, you will still continue the uh, implement? Well, the reason why, um, so let's say you enter the password correctly such that it is swordfish, all right? This if statement will execute this break and you will leave the loop. But pretend for a moment that we didn't put a break statement there, okay? If we didn't put a break statement there, but we said something like, validating your password, a print statement. <clears throat> then what would happen is, if you typed in swordfish and it said correct password or whatever, then it would go back up to the top of the loop because it reached the bottom of the block. Yeah, okay. Okay, <coughs> and since it reached the bottom of the block, it'd go back to the top of the loop and this true would still evaluate out to be true and you'd be stuck in the loop forever. So in this case, the break is necessary to get out of the loop under some condition. Another way that this same loop could have been written is if they had done something like name has the string of no length. password this string of no length, and then they could have done something like, well, name is not equal to <coughs> Joe, and password 
is not equal to swordfish. Okay, and this would have put the uh, the idea of the loop into the conditional. If you can do this kind of structuring in your programs, it will be easier for you later to rationalize about what you wrote. And when you're programming, you often get focused on particular problems. And so you'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to solve a problem. And then the clarity of what you expressed might be critical for you understanding what you wrote a few weeks before. So if you're relying on relatively complicated continues and breaks, this might be an indication that you should focus more on making your conditional express what your idea of staying in the loop is. Okay. So, uh, not is also uh, an operator, and in this case, what they are doing is they are using the not operator on the string of zero length. Okay, and so that works. It will basically indicate that nobody has entered in a name yet, and it will keep asking for input until someone types something in and then what it will do is it will basically print out how many guests will you have and then it will read that and try to convert it into an integer and then it will say if number of guests and in this case it's using a kind of promotion where zero is often interpreted as false. Yes? Do we have to care why input always outputs a string rather than whatever you put in? How does it? So the reason that, it, if this is interesting, in the next lesson we're going to talk about functions, all right? And functions always return back a single type. Oh. And so that means that you cannot make an input that returns back a number when you want it and a string when you want it. You wind up making one that is more generic and can be used in the maximum number of circumstances. And so it will always return back a string because this allows people to type text in as opposed to being some sort of specialized input only for numbers. And so here's a little example, and then they start talking about the range operator. Who understands in and range? I only see about 60%. Range produces a list of values, okay? And in basically will assign each one of those values to this variable. This is in some languages known as a for each loop. For each element in range, assign it to i. And so this means that unlike the while loop, there is actually no condition there. It's counting until basically it runs out of values provided by this range function. You can actually include your own functions that produce values if you want to do something similar to that. Um, or you can provide your own function that, uh, like in while loops, your own function that returns back true or false. It can be used as a simplification technique for making your code easier to read because you can take something that just checks five or six very small variables in ways that doesn't really express what you're talking about and put that into a function. But we'll get into that later. What happens here is, is it's going to evaluate this range and assign each value to i one at a time. It will also evaluate this block down below one time for each value of i. Okay, so in this case, 
the looping is controlled, but the looping is controlled based on the number of elements. Okay? And range happens to return back actual numbers. But these number of elements don't have to be numbers. They could be strings. They could be a list of colors. They could be whatever it is that you want. And so the looping, this for loop, loops over some quantity. And all of the for loops will loop over a quantity, generally speaking. And so here you can see the output. It starts with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? It just so happens that range, because of the way that it is built, it will not return back the number you request because of something called indexing. Uh, how well did we cover indexing last time? Uh, I think we didn't cover it at all. Yeah. OK, then I'll give a very short spill. This is supposed to be a recap. We only recap a few things that are very important. But, we didn't um, finish this chapter. I know we didn't finish the chapter, but I, I just want to recap the whole chapter because it's all flow control. And, out of everything else that they're going to learn, flow control they're going to be using for forever. So when you count things, there's two different ways of looking at it. You can look at it as a quantity, all right? But if you look at it as a quantity, then there's uh, one problem, which is the way that computers happen to use uh, storage for fast access is they start at the beginning of the storage. And so that means that if you want, and then they move an offset to the next element in the storage. All right? So if you want this to be 1, then that means that it would need to have an offset of 0 which means that the computer would have to constantly subtract. Let's say I want the fifth element. Then it would have to subtract one to four to get the offset of four. That subtraction takes time. Within computers, they simply decided that the easiest way of handling this was to teach the people who were writing programming that you start counting at zero because they want you as a developer to count in offsets, not to count in indexes. So that means that an array that happens to have five elements in it, let's say these are five sums, okay, actually only contains offsets 0 through 4. So while it might be okay to declare an array this way, you will not actually be able to use the fifth element in this array because there are no fifth elements in this array. The maximum offset is 4. When you are using any kind of array or list-like item, it is very important that you keep in your mind whether you need to be using the offset to access it or whether you need to be using a count. The size of this array that has 0 through 4 elements is going to be 5 elements <coughs> because 0 is an element. But when we start going through it, we are going to reference it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then stop. This duality of offsets and indexes is the source of at least 30% of common programming bugs in C. <laughs> So if there's anything that you learn from this class, learn when to use offsets, how to use offsets, and when to use uh, the actual sort of natural counting indexes. And this will save you from a lot of grief. So here, range, we want five 
counted items out of range, which will give us offsets 0 through 4. It's a little strange, but after a while you start to think, oh, in this scenario, I'm thinking up to 5. Up to. And that's how you translate between a count and an offset. Five elements means I count up to, but not including five. All right. Now notice that this while loop is very similar to that four I in range of five loop. In the sense that if I run this while loop, I will get the same output. The difference is in the flow control. That while uh, that four I in range of five will only go through the loop five times. Whereas this while loop might go through it once or never because this is a condition that is evaluated at runtime. Okay? That range happens to return back a <coughs> constant list. A list that is not going to vary at runtime. Notice that I had to rewrite this program to demonstrate my example. Okay? As it is written, it is guaranteed to be exactly the same. You can often use different flow controls to achieve the same output. For example, I could have put down five consecutive if statements and add one to i each time. I highly recommend you don't structure your programs this way, but the point is, is that the outputs are a side effect of going through your flow control. And so multiple flow controls can achieve the same outputs. And here we are, we're talking about range, and so here he's using range can take an optional parameter. If you provided a second parameter, then it will basically go in between these two. And conveniently, it will start at this offset and go up to, but not include, the ending offset. There are various reasons when you do enough programming why this actually becomes more convenient. But for right now, just think of it as, uh, who remembers like their old line number stuff from class school from way, way back when? Okay, so you'll know that like there's a huge difference between square brackets and little curved brackets when you say something like this. And that's supposed to be a 5, sorry. <laughs> and that basically means don't include the 5. Yeah. All right? <laughs> this is how you should interpret this. Including 12, up to, but not including 16. And if you're curious how you know this, you look up the documentation on range, and it will say something like starting index, and then they may actually use the word inclusive, sorry, to the ending index, and then they may actually use the word exclusive. Just basically means it doesn't actually include the, the last index. And so here you can see the output is 12, 13, 14, and 15 does not include 16. The reason we do this is because this is really simple. If you say made an array of five things, then you can say range of the size of that array. And you'll guarantee not to walk off the end. All right. Stepping. It's sort of a weird place, but since they're talking about uh, four loops, four each loops, 
the stepping basically allows you to control how large the step is between values. And so this would do 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and will it do 10? No. no. Awesome. You've been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I change this <coughs> from 1, what would the second value be? The first value that comes out would be 1, because we're starting at 1, correct? What would the second value be? <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, we'll just blow through this real fast then. Weird stuff. Because it's an index, there are very useful shorthands that you can use with negative numbers. For example, this we uh, took our array, and I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger so the people in the back can see. So let's take our theoretical example of that five-element array which of course starts at 0, ends at 4, 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right? <coughs> Sometimes it's really nice to refer to the last element. Some languages do this, some languages don't. Python does this. It uses the negative numbers to count indexes from the end to the beginning. And so if you're more interested in counting from the end to the beginning, you'll use a negative number. So this is basically uh, indicating that, oh, I'm sorry, this is a range function. This is not, uh, that's how you do it if you're actually indexing an array. But this is the range function. So it's basically saying that it's going to count from 5 down to negative 1 by a step of negative 1. Yes? So the forward indexes are 0 based and the backward index are 1 based? Unfortunately, if the backward indexes were 0 based, there would be two zeros. And using 0, you would never know if you were referring to the end or the beginning. <coughs> so yes. The backward indexes are one based, but um, the usually you use them so infrequently that you're almost always worried about pulling the last element of an list. So the negative one makes a really nice, easy to write flag. Now, due to weirdness in computers, there are actually negative zeros in some number systems. Python will not use a negative zero to indicate the end of a list. <clears throat> Nothing is more fun than using one of those systems and realizing that you've got a negative zero when you need to have a zero. Okay, so here we are, and so what we're going to do is we're going to read out five iterations through this loop, and every time we go through here, we're going to use the random library to select a random integer between 1 and 10. Now, knowing what we know about trailing numbers in pairs of numbers, would you expect 10 to be, just out of a guess, inclusive or exclusive? Exclusive. Exclusive. Ex very good. It would be exclusive. So this is how you actually pick a single digit number, because it will never actually pick 10. And so here you've got four different, uh, five different uh, integers, and apparently it picked a couple of them a few times. This introduces a key concept that's very important in Python, which is importing. You're not going to write your entire code in one giant file. You'll generally structure it in multiple files. Import pulls extra items in so you can use them in that file without actually having declared them in that file. I have a question. Yes? Um, for 
So how can you tell which one you have to import, which one the what range you have to import? So there's learning the language, which would be very much like learning how to express yourself and learning how the flow control and the context and how to type the languages. But then there's also learning the libraries that go with the language. And in doing that, some of it comes through just a lot of practice, like you'll probably become more familiar with the stuff inside the math library if you're doing a lot of math operations. If you're doing a lot of file operations, you'll become familiar with stuff in perhaps like a, if you're doing uh, Excel files or CSV files, maybe you'll be using a library for that. You typically look up the documentation for the functions inside these uh, imported namespaces. But, um, you know, as far as knowing if there's a function that you need in one of those, a lot of times you don't. You wind up looking for the function using the internet or using Python's online documentation. And then it'll indicate that it's in a particular package that you need to import. And then you will import that package specifically to use that function. <laughs> so, when you import, if you just use this import keyword, and the package name, you will import a lot of things. You will import everything inside random that could be used. This means that if you're using an IDE, I know that everybody was instructed to use PyCharm. So if you're typing along in PyCharm, who has seen PyCharm try to help you out and suggest the rest of the word that you were typing? All right. Who hates that feature? You guys have a lot to memorize, okay? For a lot of packages, there's so many things underneath it that you don't remember all of the wording for it. And occasionally, once you get used to too many different packages, you can't remember the particular spacing or capitalizing or whatever it is that is needed to finish that out. So that auto-completion helps you program a little bit faster, all right? If you import a whole package, and this is an indication that anything underneath that package can be used. Sometimes you just want to import a particular function. All right? For example, rand int here. Okay? I'm pretty sure that Python has a rand float. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's called. But I bet you it's underneath the random package. If I was typing R-A-N-D, I might see a suggestion that I might be wanting to use that because I've imported the entire random package. If I decided to limit my import and say from random import rand int, this is me saying I only want to import a specific function from this package and whatever else is necessary to make that work. But my program itself, if I'm not using the word rand int, then I'm referring to something that's not in that package. And so here is a perfect way of typing import random. Because you basically say, from random I'm going to import everything. Generally, you don't want to do that. You just say import random. But if you wanted to import just a specific module, then you could say from random import rand int. A, a specific function underneath that module. And then Python covers sysexit. Sysexit is a little controversial, but it's very important. It's a way of causing the Python interpreter to just stop and quit. The reason it's a little controversial is because if you get a program that's full of sysexits, it gets very hard to rationalize which part of that program stopped your program. You start having to put in debugging information and other things. So use it sparingly. But every now and then, it is a really good idea to just bail out. And to do so, you would use sysexit. So we have covered all of the Python flow control. It's now 7 o'clock. The pizza's here. I would like you to get some food and uh, 
And then we'll take a poll on whether or not we want to cover the practice questions, or if enough of you did the practice questions at home, maybe we'll just spot check one or two hard ones, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. Okay. Let's see how many of these practice questions go. First off, did anybody do the practice questions before coming to this class? Is that the same as the exercises? It's the same as the section at the bottom, the practice questions here. There's something called exercises in the book. Well, the exercises are probably a different section. So, practice question. What are the two values of the Boolean data type? True and false. True and false. True and false. How are they written? Capital. Capital. True. Capital. Capitalized. capitalized. Correct. Not all capitals, just the first letter. All right. What are the three Boolean operators? And, and or not. Or not. Or not. Very good. Write out the truth tables of each Boolean operator in your own time. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it real fast. It's not that. <laughs> Okay, so here is the variable A. All right, and then that means that if this is, uh, well, I guess I wrote it wrong already. <laughs> so we'll say this is not. Here is A is true and here is A is false. Okay, so not A is not A prime. That's false. Okay, fine. <laughs> it may be easier to use. I'm going to use TNF because as soon as he said A prime, I realized my mistake. <laughs> so when A is true, false. False. then this value is false. False. When A is false, then this value is true. true. Okay, good. Can you leave them up? Fine, I'll do, I'll do this. You'll get more than one truth. Not true is false. Not <laughs> false is true. <laughs> A is true and B is false. False. And when A is false and B is false. False. Very good. Four. A is true or B is true. 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 <coughs> A is false or B is true. True. A is true or B is false. True. A is false or B is false. False. Very good. Various combinations of and, or, and not can generate any specific one of these items to true or false as you need. There are also other operations that combine them, but you don't have to worry about that for Python conditionals. All right? But if you start looking into truth tables, you might see things that are like, NAND. You might go, well, what's NAND? NAND is the not of AND. OK? You might see NOR. That's the not of OR. And you might see this one, XOR. Who can tell me what XOR is? Exclusive or. Exclusive or. Exclusive or, okay, fantastic. What do you think the truth table for an exclusive or might look like? 
False, true, true, false. True and true, true, X or true? False. False. False, X or true? True, true. True, true X or false? True. true. False, X or false? False. Right. Exclusive, only one of them. Whereas regular or doesn't matter. Both of them could be true. But exclusive or differs. Okay. Exclusive or is important because you'll wind up with a lot of programming scenarios where you'll need something very similar to it. So the idea of an exclusive or operation should not be pointed to you. All right. What do the following expressions evaluate to? Well, let's start off. Expressions evaluate from inner parentheses to outer parentheses, just like they do in math. What's this sub-expression evaluate to? True. True. What's this sub-expression evaluate to? False. True and false is? False. False. All right. What's this sub-expression evaluate to? True. True. Not of that? False. True. 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 False. False. True. 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 Very good. True. True. False. True. 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 False. False. Very good. True. True. False. 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 Very good. True. <coughs> False. True. True. Awesome. What are the six comparison operators? We kind of glossed over this in the recap, and I remember Evan covered it when he was going through the, the chapter in more detail. I'm going to spare you having to call them all out. Greater than, or actually that's less than, greater than, <laughs> greater than or equal, less than equal, equals and not equals, right? Why can't you use these on booleans? Booleans are just false. Yeah, there's no such thing. True is not inherently greater than false. It's just the only other value. Okay. Difference between the equal operator and the assignment operator. Let's start off with how do we write the the equality operator? Two equal signs. Awesome. Next for comparison. How do we write the assignment operator? What's the difference between these two statements? Right. So basically, which one of these will evaluate out to a Boolean? The bottom one. Because it's a comparison. The top one, what will it do roughly? Assign B to A. Correct, meaning that it will actually take the value that's currently associated with B and make that the value that is currently associated with A. <coughs> what is a condition? It's an expression that could turn Sorry. into a true or false value. Okay. When would you use it? Very good. When else would you use it? A while loop. A while loop. Very good. Any time that you basically need to do a control flow, switch. Okay. It says identify the three blocks in this code, which is horrible because I actually see more than three blocks. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm going to highlight sections and for the ease of simplicity. You tell me if it's a block or not. Okay, I hear a yes. It is not. It's not a block. It is a statement. But remember that if statements have a conditional, a keyword if, a conditional, and a block. So this whole thing is not a block. The 
print underneath it is, okay, <coughs> is that a block? Oh, no. Of course not. You're not going to fall for the same trick twice, right? <laughs> <coughs> is that a block? Okay, I heard yes, but actually it is not. This is just the complete if statement. The statement happens to have two blocks controlled by the evaluation of the conditional. Is that, including the P, a block? Yes. Absolutely. Likewise, that is. Is that a block? Yes. All right, does this block have one statement in it? No. No. How will the statements be evaluated in this block? Are you answering, asking how will we step through it? Yeah, how, how, what's the flow control in the block? How well, will this block be evaluated? Well, the first, well, it was print spam. Or, or one spam. statement at a time, mm -hmm. okay? So that means that the first this statement will be evaluated, then this whole statement here will be evaluated, and then this third statement will be evaluated. Okay? Now, in evaluating this middle statement, we may enter one or the other of those blocks, but we won't enter both. Okay? Ah. My mouse boo is not very strong. Is that a block? No. 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 I heard a no, it was faint, but it was correct. Is that a statement? Yes. 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 Now it's a statement that includes other statements, but it is a single statement because it is the entire statement of this if. Alright? Is that not including the identify at the top <laughs> question, a block. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Write code that prints hello if one is stored in spam and prints howdy if one is if two is stored in spam and prints greeting if anything else is stored in spam. I will simplify this. What kind of flow control construct do I need to do this? If, if else. If, 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 else. If, else, if, else. Okay? If spam is one, a block that prints hello. If else, if, it's two, a block that prints howdy. Else, prints greetings. Okay. What can you press if your program is stuck in an infinite loop? Control C. Awesome. Okay, we didn't cover that in the recap, but Control C will basically send an interrupt to your program, and that should break it and stop its execution. Fortunately, nobody set the power button. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between break and continue? Break jumps out of post block, and continue jumps into it. So they actually both jump out of the block that they're in. But it, the key is where they jump to. Yes? Uh, break will exit the, the loop entirely. Uh, continue will just go to the next iteration. Very good. So they both exit the block that they're in, but the difference is, is that, and because it's, maybe they can't all hear, break will take you out of the loop statement. Continue will put you back evaluating the next item in the loop the next conditional evaluation. What's the difference between range 10, range 0, 10, and range 0, 10, 1 in a for loop? Actually, they don't even have to be in a for loop. Just what's the difference between them? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. This one, because there's only one parameter passed in, it assumes you're starting at 0. What are the numbers in range 10? 0 through 9. 0 through 9. Good. This one, you explicitly start at 0. What are the numbers in that one? 0 through 9. Yeah. 
This one you explicitly start at zero, and you explicitly increment only one digit, uh, one value at a time. Again, zero through nine. Write a short program that prints the numbers one to 10 using a for loop. Then write the same one that prints one to 10 using a while loop. Let's use range. What should be in this? One, what should be the ending? 11. 11, colon, okay. Print on. All right, now let's do it with the wall loop. I need something there. Less than or equal to 10. Okay, so we'll do less than or equal to 10. All right. Will that work? No. Why? There's a couple of reasons why. Need to initialize i. Outside. We don't know what i is. So this thing can never evaluate correctly the first time. So should I put, if I'm writing this i initialization line, where should I put it? Should I put it in line with the p on the print or in line with the w on the Okay. What should it start at? Very good. Python doesn't increment the wireless. Ah, you're right. It's not done. What will this do? Go Go into an infinite loop, printing one infinite loop. We need one more thing. That's one way of doing it. For those of you who realize that there's a pattern of a equals a something, some value, a lot of times you'll, they will be a combined operator, which basically <laughs> takes this operation here and moves it over to here in front of the equal sign, and then takes this value and puts it there. So this is the same thing as saying add one to a. Okay, because adding one is so common, apparently we can't have enough ways of doing it. So this would also be adding one to i. Okay, as would that. Okay, the difference is, is when you're using assignment, and this will come up in any kind of basic programming question where the people are trying to figure out if you actually do know how to program. X will have the value in this case of I. And then I will have the value of I plus one. And the reason why is because this plus is on the right hand side and it's shorthand, it's not actually implemented in any way that makes a lot of sense if you take a look at the, the instructions inside the CPU, but it's shorthand for I and then add one. Okay, I have a question. I'm yes. In the IDE, just trying to print that out where it has R++ without assigning to anything, and it's giving me an error syntax error saying that I can't do R++. You Does need it have to, to assign a to? number to R first. It there has a number assigned to it. Oh, yeah. there is one plus plus in Python? No, Python only has plus yeah. equals. Sorry about That's that, guys. Java or C. This is too much, too many different programming languages, and one is intruding upon the other in my brain. <laughs> so there is no plus plus operator, forget about that. You can do it in Java if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Continuing on with Java Lambdas. No. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we go for Eda next? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if I have a function named bacon inside a module named spam, how would I call bacon after I imported spam? Spam.bacon? Spam.bacon, yes. Okay, I could also use the, uh, the from and make bacon a uh, top level keyword. How about spam spam.estimates? It wouldn't know which one to call. See, spam.bacon, it's going to know to call the bacon function. But if you, did but if you I tried to call spam, not asterisk. No, but if you imported spam, not asterisk, then you could call bacon without using spam. That's true. OK. So let's go to chapter three. Finally got out of flow control and now we're into functions. And the funny thing is, is that functions are actually also a key component of flow control. But the difference between function flow control and other flow control is that functions, you declare a block of code and you bind it to a function signature, a name. So this basically defines hello to be this block, which is not very well aligned, but I believe all three of these prints are supposed to be aligned. And then it will print, howdy, howdy, hello there. Now, down here where he uses this function, you, it will print these three items. And when the function gets used again, it will print these three items again. And when the function gets used again, it will print these items again. The main point of a function is you have defined some sort of block that you can now reference to it as a name. And so you've built your own hello name that you can use. Now, hello is probably not going to be something that you write a lot of in industry, but you might have a routine that says, checks to see if a server is up. And you probably don't want to type that code in multiple times. So you'll probably put that into a function that says something like check email server. In which case, now you have a nice little handy function. And it's very expressive. It tells you what it does. Always try to look for names of your functions that tell you what it's used for, what it does from a user's point of view. Don't try to use names for functions that talk about how the function goes about it. I didn't, for example, say check email server by saying open up a port, send a message, and see if the email server responds. Because this gets too into the details of what is happening. And it doesn't summarize the information. This makes it harder for you to actually maintain your programs because you wind up not never summarizing anything. It's sort of like, what did you do today? Well, first I woke up, and I pulled the bed sheets off, and I stood up, and then I took about eight steps forward to clear the bed, and took a left-hand churn and about 12 more steps to go into the hall. You know, after a while, people will lose the train of thought of getting ready for work. <clears throat> the whole point is, is that you want your functions to give the right amount of summary. They want to be something that I can look at. It's like, should I use this function? I don't know. Do you want to check the email server? You know, you don't need to know the details in the name. Okay, so <coughs> how do we create a new function? Well, we've kind of gotten ahead of ourselves. We use define, the def keyboard. And so this def and this colon and this block all combine to make a function declaration. And it will take this hello. And whenever you use this hello, 
it will execute this bit. So, you'll notice something about the format of this hello. It has an open and a closed parenthesis. We've seen this before. We've seen this before even in the print. The print has an open and closed parenthesis. This is a common pattern in Python. That's because print is a function. When you print something, you're just calling another function. It's jumping into another piece of code somewhere, and it is performing the low-level operations in order to get some text onto the screen. This item that is passed inside the print is called a parameter. It's a value that is passed to the print function. That value is the value that will be echoed to the screen. This hello, you'll notice that there's something missing there. And that's the stuff in between the parentheses. This is an indication that this hello function takes no arguments. So when we're starting to talk about the, the functions, here we can see the output of the three calls that we had mentioned before. Hello, hello, hello. It prints that block one. It runs through that block one time, printing three lines. It runs through that block a second time, printing three lines. And it runs through that block a third time, printing three lines. We could have, remember that flow control is about making your programs easy to understand and easy to rationalize and easy to structure. You can almost always get the same output with a different flow control. Here is a program that doesn't have the hello function, but produces the exact same output. What do you notice about this program that you see different in the hello program? Repetition. Repetition. Hmm? Repetition. Repetition. A lot of it, too, right? So what if I decided that I was going to make sure that my program didn't have any colloquial phraseology from Texas. I needed to strip my program of all of its howdies. Which one would be easier to update? The first one. The first one, because I just changed one howdy. And everybody who uses my function will get hello without howdy. Sad world it may be, but still, <laughs> it's easier to maintain. Now this one, which happens to produce the exactly the same output, where do you think the dangers would be in maintaining a program written like this? You have to check through localization. <laughs> <laughs> Without going into any of the 18 N words. <laughs> so you might change one or two of them, but not, not all of them. Exactly. Especially if my program is written this way to where I am actually repeating many times the actual text, I might not even be able to get them all on the same screen. I'll probably hit a few of them, and I'll probably miss a few. So there's a general value in programming. And when I say a value, I'm talking about like, you know, we value honesty more, well, okay, some people value honesty more than lying. <laughs> or, you know, we value uh, elegance more than being, like, really sloppy. You know, some people have different values, and their values are, by definition, different. In programming, it's generally a good thing if you avoid excessive repetition. So who has ever programmed outside of Python. Okay. Now all of your people, if I see one of your hands go down, who has ever cut and paste code? <laughs> <laughs> we all value not repeating ourselves, and yet cutting and pasting code is the definition of repeating ourselves. There is a time and a place for it. It is driven by economics. Okay? Sometimes it's more expensive to go back and try to rework everything to use some sort of a generic solution. And so you cut and paste something and you change one value. What happens a year later? It's harder to maintain that program. 
And if you've cut and paste a lot, it may even be nigh impossible to maintain the program. Point is, is that these kinds of trade-offs that you make between, say, efficiency of getting the solution out now and your ability to maintain a program later is going to determine how people view you, but they're not going to determine how people view you now. They're going to determine how people view you later. Today, you might go fast, but tomorrow you can't because now there are too many copies to update, too many copies to check, and too many things that you've got to make sure all work with the new data structure or the new paradigm or the new interface or the new API. So it's very difficult, but generally, if you can find a balance where you go slow enough to not make a big enough mess, you can actually maintain a higher speed over the course of the application. And where that comes in is primarily a function of experience. So here, as you get more programming experience, if you were not careful with your cut and paste, you will spend a lot of time deduplicating code. Because deduplicating is a fast, fancy way of saying undoing the cut and paste. And doing it the slow way, you should have done it the first time. But that said, it's all about readability. Occasionally, you will parameterize something. You will parameterize it so well that you no longer even understand what it does. Because everything that goes into it is a parameter. Try to find a happy balance. <laughs> all right, so here we go. When we call print or length, you pass values into it, right? So when you pass values into it, you need to define your function a slightly different way. You need to define it with some sort of way of referencing the value that you passed into it. And so what you do is you, and this is horrible because they picked absolutely the wrong variable name for this, but you put a name in your parameter list. And this is probably one of those horrible inside jokes, but really what I would say is something like, I would have said, hello, user, then print, hello, user, because even, even something as small as that is more descriptive than name, because a name can be a name of anything. Whereas this, at least you get an idea of its user. It might even be more descriptive to say person or first name. First name, I think, is a winner. Never be afraid to take a few moments to try to rename whatever it is that you're doing to make it easier to understand in the future. This will maintain the usability of your programs longer term than anything else. And picking a good variable name can be difficult. But take the time to do it. So here, if I say, hello, Alice, what will happen here? Has anybody pre-read this chapter? Okay, I saw about six hands go up. Someone who did not raise their hand, what do you think would happen with hello, Alice? You would say hello, Alice. It would say hello, Alice. Do you know why? This value would be bound to this variable called name. So in the execution of this hello function, it would say hello and the value inside name. And so it would say hello plus this string of Alice. In Python, when you do one string plus another string, it sticks them together. Concatenation makes a big long string out of it and it would print hello Alice, just as it does right here. Now, that Alice is not somehow permanently fixed to this name. It's only fixed within the context of this first line next to three. When you reuse the function with Bob, name will be bound to the value Bob, and you will print out hello Bob. 
And so when you run this program with Hello Alice and Hello Bob, you get two different outputs. Because the first time, name is bound to the string Alice, and the second time, it is bound to the string Bob. OK. And that's what they just said there. Uh, so if you ran Hello Alice up here, all right, and then you ran Hello Bob and it printed out Alice again, then that would indicate that somewhere along the way, the value Alice was retained. It is possible to write functions in such a way that you wind up retaining values in various locations. You could say inside the body of the function, store the string in a database and pull it out later. <laughs> but you can't do that with this example. Okay? And so what would happen is they're trying to emphasize that the scope of the binding, how long this name holds the value passed into it, is determined by the function itself. Once I leave the block of the function, name does not have a value. Matter of fact, once I leave the block of this function, the variable name does not exist. It is created for the scope of this function, and it is lost as I leave this function. In between this hello Alice and hello Bob, if I say, what is the value of name? The correct answer is, there is no name. Because there is no name on this scope. So working through, how do you use a function in such a way? It's fair to ask, where does name, where, where does it reside? Where does it hide? Because next time you call the function, you're going to give it an argument. And that argument is going to go looking for the Variable, right? That's true, that's true. We'll talk a little bit about the scoping, but for right now I'm going to simplify it and say that in our def below, first name, you can sort of think of it as before this block is created, it adds a variable name, first name. And then as you're leaving this block, it destroys that variable. OK? And so that variable only exists inside the block. So when we're calling hello down here, You're not in this block in between the two lines. You, you, the way that flow control works for functions is you enter this line, and this line jumps to execute the block of the function, and then it jumps back immediately afterwards. So you're not in this block in between the lines, the two hello lines. But you are in this block while you're processing this function. Okay? Does that make it a little? Yeah, it does. Okay, fantastic. Yes? Um, so the parameter is only the same type. The parameter passes all strings. Yeah. Does it only string? No. Or the default string? Neither. So Python is uh, strictly typed, but it is not, um, oh good, wait, wait, I keep getting this backward. Evan, spot check me on this. Python, the variables are, the values have types, but the variables themselves don't enforce the types. So is that strict or strong? It is said to be a strongly typed, dynamically bound, Fantastic. Thank you. So basically, <laughs> the variables have Why types. Yes. The variables have types. I'm sorry. I'm set it backwards again. The values have types. 
but the variables don't restrict a particular type. So there's nothing inside this hello first name that forces me to pass a string. I could pass a number to it. Right, but it would treat it as if it was a string as well? No. When you use it as a block? No, it'll treat the number as a number, and then I'll probably get an error when I hit down to the print. Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Numbers don't auto. Did numbers promote to strings? I can't remember. Did numbers promote to strings? No. Okay, so the concatenation operation is fell. Yeah, okay, there you go. All right, so now functions are interesting, but there's very few times when you don't. Uh, there's something that happens a lot where you need a value. Like you'll have a function to look something up in a database. Maybe you'll do it by like an ID or a first name or something like that. And you'd like to get a value back. Okay, when you get a value back, there's a special keyword that's related to Python functions called return. So much in the... Uh, so if I define a function, I could do something like, you know, search the database. basically decide that I want to return that record back. Return means that when I call this get user, the evaluation of this function call is effectively going to be replaced with the value that is returned. So if I wanted to create a function called add, <coughs> and it will take two, two variables, a first variable and a second variable, and I say return first plus the second, then what will happen is it will perform this math operation here, adding these two values together, and then it will return the result of that. So that means that I could say something like x equals add 3, 5. When this gets evaluated as a statement, it will try to figure out the value first, on the right hand side of the assignment operator. And this 3, 5 will jump into the function. Here, it'll be 3 plus 5, so it'll be 8. It'll return 8, and it's going to effectively say that the value of this entire add operation is 8. And that will be the value that comes back from an add and is assigned to x. So functions that evaluate out to a value have return statements in them that return the value that, you know, is produced through the evaluation of the function. I know I'm stepping over my, my tongue here and trying to describe it. Does anybody have difficulty understanding this concept? Okay. If you do, by all means, Go on to Discord, pull one of us aside or something, because this is critical if, uh, for uh, people who are not used to programming. So here's import Miranda, and we've defined a function, get answer, and we've defined a parameter, answer number. And if answer number is equal to 1, then we say it is certain. If it's equal to 2, decidedly so, 3, yes. Four, reply, hazy, try again. Who's ever used a magic eight ball? 
There you go. It should look familiar. Concentrate and ask again. My reply is no. Outlook not so good. Very doubtful. Here we use the random int function to get a number between 1 and 8. Remember, 9 is not included. And then we're going to pass that number in to get answer. And then we're going to print out the fortune. And so the main idea here is we don't know what number we passed in to get answer. But that will become bound to this answer number. And then as we compare the answer number through this very large if else if statement, we will eventually trigger on something, hopefully, and return back a string, being the famous printed side of the magic eight ball. Then we will print that. Okay, so I talked you through it, so I'm going to spare the reading of the talk through it. <laughs> and uh, what we want to focus on is this R here. R is the argument of the function. Now some people say, what's the difference between an argument and a parameter? And it's really the point in time in which you're considering the same thing. An argument is a value that's passed into a function, okay? And a parameter is the name that will be temporarily assigned to that value. That said, people are very sloppy in their language, and so they will say something like, oh yes, I passed R as a parameter. Well, actually, I guess that's still technically correct, but sometimes they will say, Oh, it took the parameter R. Okay? You will just have to understand that when you're passing something to a function, you're not passing the variable R. You can't get the text R interior to the function. It doesn't exist in that scope. Instead, what happens is the value is rebound to answer number. Okay? Now, if I had put that R in quotes, then that would have had a value of the string of R, and the values get passed through to functions. So values get passed to functions, and so if you pass a variable into a function, it will resolve the value of that variable and pass the value. But it won't pass the variable name. You understand that? So the parameter word. is just the name, right? It's not really like a value, it's just the name of a value. A parameter is a name inside the scope of the function. Mm -hmm. So this get answer has an answer number parameter. Okay? But it's not the name that somehow is really being passed. It's the value. And to reference that value, you will use this name inside the function. And when you're outside of that function, it will be whatever you passed in. It could be an actual type value, or it could be a variable. Yes. Can you say that the parameter is part of the definition, and the value is part of the call? That is, that the, the argument is part of the call? You have the right idea. The parameter is part of the definition, but there's a lot of them. And I hate to use this word because it's overloaded already. But there's, OK, I'll use a different word. There's a lot of discussion as to what to properly call the thing that is pushed into it. Okay? Managed to dodge using the word argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here it's saying the get answer is called with R as the argument. Okay? Which inside that, it will find out the value of R and it will bind it to a parameter answer number. So, this R right here is a variable and it was defined in order to hold the random number. You don't need intermediate variables. 
Sometimes they're very useful, and sometimes they're not. In this case, the variable r expresses nothing to me as a human being, except that it's a letter in the alphabet. So I would probably write it as get answer taking the value passed from this function and just passing it directly in as parameter. All right? However, if you start doing a lot of these, sometimes it can get pretty hairy. This is the print, the get answer of the random number. All right? When those lines get too long, occasionally it's nice to know what a value is somewhere in between all of the passing of these values to these nested functions. In that case, pick a better variable name. Right? And then hold it as an intermediate. But I do see this programming style crop up a lot where you define a new name to hold every return value from every return function. Here you run into the other problem of now you have 500 names and you don't know what they all mean because you could probably only remember about six or seven. Okay, so try to make sure that your functions, you know, your routines within any page, you only need to remember like half a dozen variables and it'll be easier to maintain over time. The none value. Who's programmed in a different programming language than Python? Every now and then you have a value that means nothing. Okay? In Python, this value is none. None is not a string. None is not a number. Famously, C decided to use the number zero to mean nothing in a lot of cases, but unfortunately it also means zero in a lot of other cases. <laughs> Python sidestepped all the bugs you could introduce doing something like that with a new value called none. All right? So, an array that doesn't have anything stored in it is not exactly the same thing as no, era, no array. None is a very distinct value that indicates the absence of something. Okay? So, when you do not return a value from a function, that function actually still returns a value. It just returns the none value. And so what they're showing you here is that print, it doesn't have a, a side value to return. It's the side effect is displaying text to the screen. It's not going to actually return a value like our add example does. But you can still capture the not returned value and that means that spam will hold the value none. Okay, this makes it a little bit easier like if you ever worked in a programming language where they actually had a keyword that you couldn't capture. Like I, Java has void. If you try to assign a void function to a variable, it'll say like, no, this function doesn't return back a value, and you get an error. That limits some of the kinds of programming that you can do. Python's slightly more flexible in this way. It'll just return back the none value. Which means at the end of every block, if it's not written there, you can kind of deduce that it has an implied return none or every block inside a uh, function. So keyword arguments in print. <coughs> if you ran this program, by now I know that you've gone through enough examples, you know exactly what this will print out. All right? However, Python has optional arguments that are named. They are called keyword arguments. They are not handled the same way that positional arguments are. So when we talked about like range, we had two numbers. One number came first, the next number came second, the third number came third, and these numbers meant different things based off of the position inside the parameter list. Keyword arguments bind to keywords. That means that if I move this end before the print, things would still work. 
and it wouldn't actually change the value. This end is a keyword argument. Have you ever noticed that in Python, when you print something out, you get to the next line? If you print out two things with two print statements, you're down to two lines. Sometimes you want to stay on the same line. This end overrides the new line that drops you to the next line with nothing. So it will print hello and then nothing instead of hello and then a new line command. So here, printing this hello with a non-default ending, and then the world combines these two to hello world with no space. Now if I put a space in here, then it would be hello space world. And if I put a comma in here, then it would be hello comma world. And if I put a new line explicitly in there, then it would be hello and world with a new line in between, so they'd be on two different lines. Okay? Now, you wouldn't need to put a new line because keyword parameters often have default values associated with them. This is the reason why uh, they just work really nicely together. This is the reason why they're keywords. You don't have to override the default value. Int has a default value of new line. So here, one thing that you may or may not have done, I'm not sure, is who has ever printed out three strings separated by commas, or two strings separated by a comma. Okay, what happens, generally speaking? The thing that I have right there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you get a space between them, right? Okay. Of course, if you replace these with plus, it would combine all those strings to one string, and then just print out the one string. But if you've got commas in here, it prints them out with nice little spaces. It makes it real easy to print out lists of items. That's because there's a separator keyword that has a default value of space. Assuming that you want commas in between these items, you can override this separator keyword to be the value comma. And so in this case, it would print the same thing that it printed before, but now it is printing out commas as the item separator. And you can do comma space? I believe you can. Okay, so this keyword idea is going to have an impact. When you decide that you want to write a uh, new function, you will use what keyword in order to indicate you're starting a function? Def. 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 How do you end the signature of the function? Indentation? Colon. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Okay, so you the function, def, function name, open your parentheses, your parameters, close your parentheses, colon, what goes underneath that? A code block. A code block. Very good. Now, when you're defining those parameters, you will find, as we move on, that you can also define your own keyword parameters. These are not special things. You can write your own functions with keyword parameters. But before we talk about how to write keyword parameters, we're going to talk about scope because, of course, I would introduce something in a little bit different order than they're talking. We went over this in perhaps too much detail. So I'm going to call them up with a function and uh, I'll call it, uh, I don't know, give me a name. A name, foo, foo. We'll go with foo, then foo bar baz. Okay, and so here's my function foo and here's my block. Okay. And it's, it's basically just going to print whatever I passed it. Now, we talked about how long this variable a exists, right? It exists within the scope of the function. If I did 
something like a is 5. I define a, well, here, I'll define the foo up front, and then I'll say a is 5. Okay? And then if I say foo a, this is confusing in some ways because I'm using the same name as is inside this scope. Okay? But actually what happens is the value of A is extracted here and the 5 is passed and then rebound to this variable up here. So this A is not this A. This A is confined to this block. This A is confined to this block. Just because it's a function call does not mean that the variables from this block leak into that block. All right? Now there are some exceptions, but we'll get to those. So let's do this. Yeah, so you mean you could, the five could not get into the def? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to ask the question. No problem. Maybe it'll become clear in this extra example. Here, I pass 5 in through here. That should do it. If I pass 9 in here, in this block, I'm calling foo, right? What will the value of A be? 9. 9. What will this operation do? Set B equal to 9. Set B equal to 9. And then it will print. Nine. And so if I come back down here and say print B, what will this print? Five. Five. Because this B is scoped within this A. It is not the same B as this scope. Okay? Because when I'm thinking about writing this function, I don't want to have to scan my entire code base to find out if I already use that variable in some module somewhere, maybe even in something that I have not imported yet. So the reach of this variable b is only within this block. What if at the very top of the file you had a b equals zero? <laughs> You actually have to declare inside the block that you're using the B outside the block with a keyword called global. Okay? Which is, surprisingly enough, the next thing that they talk about. <laughs> so local variables cannot be used in the global scope. Here they define 31337 to eggs, and then they try to print eggs out in a higher scope. This won't work. Why? The egg only exists within the scope of the spam. <laughs> exactly. Egg only exists within the scope of the spam function. So this means that this will say, hey, I have no idea what variable you're talking about because that variable doesn't exist at this scope. Okay? And so here, when he runs it, it says, hey, you're trying to print eggs, but uh, eggs isn't defined. It is defined within the spam function, but it's not defined within the scope that you're trying to print it at. So local scopes. Cannot use variables in other local scopes. I didn't go over this, but basically if you have two functions, here we've got spam where we set eggs to 99. Here we've got bacon where we set eggs to zero. All right. This setting eggs to zero, this eggs is defined in the scope of bacon. So it's not just about global scope and function scope. This eggs does not exist in this scope as the same variable. This eggs is local to bacon. This eggs is local to spam. When we get to this print eggs, which eggs do you think it will print? The zero or the 99? 99. The 99, because as soon as this one is set to zero, we leave bacon, this variable scope gets destroyed, 
and we're back into the spam scope, where completely different eggs, just happens to coincidentally be typed the same, exists. Global variables can be read in a local scope. Okay? So in other words, here we've got this function spam that prints eggs, and eggs, as you had mentioned before, at the top scope was set to a value. And you can read it. However, if you try to set it, what will happen? The syntax of Python's assignment operation will declare an eggs local to the scope of spam. So you don't actually wind up setting it in the global scope. Instead, what you need to do is to make that work in the global scope. You need to add the global keyword. And that's an indication that when we assign, we're not assigning in our scope. We're assigning in the global scope. Now, I kind of went through this sections pretty quickly. And so I'd like to know whether or not I lost anybody. Because we can go through the, the examples in more detail. And if you say nothing, we will go through the examples in more detail. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I mean, is there a legitimate reason to do this, to bother with the global scope? I mean, there might be legitimate reasons, but I mean, would you do it? <laughs> so this is a controversial topic. Um, generally, global variables make things much harder yeah. to uh, rework over time because the global variables act as like silent communication channels between the different parts of programs. But occasionally, global variables turn out to be really useful. Uh, for example, if you say had a function that loaded a database driver. Uh, you probably don't want that database driver that you just loaded from disk to be gone as soon as you left that function. You might want it to hang around for the next time you tried to call the database. So they may have like a table of database drivers held in a global scope. Okay. And so the second time that you go and access the database driver, it can find the side effects of the previous call. Now that might be one example and probably a better example of when to use a global scope, but there's no reason to write your program that way. You could quite easily have had the load driver return the database driver code or whatever, and then you could have easily registered that with another function call. Okay? There's no need to structure your code a particular way, but occasionally some of these patterns come up. Uh, if you want a good maintainable program, do try to avoid variables in the global scope, unless it just rationally doesn't make sense to do otherwise. So here we are, and we're going to do some horrible things with spam, eggs, and bacon, because it's the old Monty Python spam, 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 and more spam stuff. <laughs> but the point is, is that here, He's saying that eggs has a bacon local value and then prints, and then he calls spam, which has a spam local value and prints, and then he has a global value. And so when you say bacon, then bacon prints bacon local, then it goes into spam, which will print spam local, then it'll print bacon local again, and then it'll print global. And here we are with the global statement where we basically say, no, we're actually changing the variable at the global scope. So you can go through the rules, if the variables being used in the global scope. It's a global variable. It can be read from inside functions. It just cannot be assigned, okay? Unless you use what keyword? Global. Global. All right.
can tell me why this doesn't work? No. This hasn't been defined. Exactly. At the first time that you attempt to use spam, then what's going to happen is this print statement, as it's being evaluated here, you have no variable eggs. It's not a parameter that's passed through. It doesn't know when you're defining this function that eggs is going to be declared later on as a global. So you run into problems of order of loading. This is another good reason to avoid globals because it basically means you have to restructure your programs in certain ways that you can find the globals within the functions. Passing the items through the functions is a lot easier. All right. What's one of the thing? What's the only number you can't divide by? Zero. Zero. Do computers change that? Yeah. No. Nope. So when you divide by zero, what do you think a computer should do? Go to error. Return out a number. <laughs> no one has decided yet. <laughs> okay. Some people might argue you should return not a number. There have been a few people who have decided it's easier to return some sort of a symbol that indicates an infinite number. There are a few people who decide that it's a good idea to just stop the execution of your entire program and dump core. <laughs> and then there's a few people that basically decide to come up with some sort of error handling routine. Python uses exceptions. Who does not know what an exception is? Okay, good. An exception is a condition in your program which really generally should not happen or happens so rarely that you should never really account for it all the time. Exceptions are unusual in the sense that exceptions in Python have a different flow control than all of the stuff that we've talked about before. Exceptions interrupt normal flow control. And you do this through throwing an exception. And there's a throw keyword. So right here, here's divided by. And this little divided by uh, function, or the spam function that divides by, has a subtle problem in it. And since we've been talking about division by zero, I'm pretty sure you know what the problem is. What happens when I say spam zero? It throws an exception. A black hole opens up and swallows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Depending upon how deeply nested it is in your critical enterprise application, a black hole may swallow your heart. <laughs> Unfortunately, your body will still exist to finish debugging the program. It's going to basically not be able to perform this operation because this operation is not formidable within the realm of mathematics. And so it will throw an exception. And you will get this very interesting divide by zero exception. So this is what it looks like when you divide by zero in Python. And you'll notice this zero division error, division by zero. And it'll very conveniently be processed by the Python engine, the parts of the Python engine that are still running your program, and display sort of the rationale of where this exception came from and how it bubbled up to eventually stopping the program. And so you can see that it says basically, most recent call last, because for usually you're more interested in where the exception ended initially. And so it'll say, hey, you tried to do this, but inside this, that's the line that threw it. And so it'll talk about where it got caught and where it originated and how it trickled up through all of the function calls that are nested all the way down to the thing that raised the exception. 
And then it'll give you a nice little printout of the exception. This is the exception name. And this is some sort of descriptive helpful text. And so one of the things that you can do, though, is you can actually prevent your program from dying. You can try things. And try is an indication that, yes, you do want to do this, but if it doesn't work, you don't want the entire program to stop running. And when you try this, then what you do is you use a new kind of handler that handles this exceptional flow control. And so we're going to try to divide by zero, except if we get a zero division error, then we will just simply print, you gave us an invalid argument. And it won't crash the program, and we won't get that stack trace. So here, this call will print out 21. This call will print out something gross, well, I guess three. And then this call will print out error invalid argument. Yes? But you're not returning a string. There is no return value to print. So does it print none? Well, it will print out first because the exception got caught. Error invalid argument, and then it will print out none. And then this one will print out 42. And that's because you're right. Every function returns back a value, even if that value is none. And so as it catches the divide by zero, this print happens. And then this thing can't evaluate out to a proper return value because it can't perform this operation. It'll hit the end of the block and hit that implicit return none. So 21, 3.5 invalid argument, none, 42. All right. Now, that's how you would catch it if you're trying to catch it inside this function. But there's no need to catch it just inside that function. You can catch it somewhere else. Remember, it's going to bump up through all of the calls until it gets to the top, and then it'll crash your program. So you could put the try around the prints. And what will happen now is it'll print out that 21, that 3.5. And then at this point, it's going to throw the exception and when it throws the exception, it falls into this try except statement, and it will cause print invalid argument. And because you exited this block, uh, this line, into the exception block, it will not print the handling for spam one. Matter of fact, it won't return a value back here because it's actually going to die in the call of spam zero before it even gets to the outer call of printing that return value. So in this case, there is no none. Can you see that flow control there? It completely violates all of the flow control statements that we've studied before. It's not a loop. It's not a conditional. It's not a function call. Instead, what it does is it uses an exceptional flow of throwing an exception until it bubbles up all of your nested function calls and is either caught by the top level Python handler or caught by an exception handler that you provided somewhere between the exception and the top level handler. If it's caught by the top level handler, it will print the stack trace and, and exit your Python uh, program. All right, number guessing games. This is a, who's ever programmed this in any language before? Awesome. Okay, I see about 20% of the class, maybe, maybe 15. Who really wants to cover this one? <laughs> uh, you're standing up, I think you volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. 
So this is the game that we all played as kids. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 37. No, you need to guess higher. No, you need to guess lower. Basically, you use random, or in this case, uh, use random to pick a number between 1 and 20. Ask the player to guess six times, which basically means that we're going to use the range operator and guesses taken will be the guess number. Print, take a guess, read the input. Inputs come in as a string. string. So we need to convert it to a number so we can basically do the comparison correctly. Is the guess Less than the secret number? Ah, if it is, your guess is too low. Is the guess higher than the secret number? Your guess is too high? Otherwise, let's exit this whole guessing loop. At the end, if we got out of the guessing loop and the guess happens to be the secret number, print, good job, you guessed my number in so many guesses. Otherwise, print, nope. The number I was thinking of was, and then you spill the beans and tell them your secret number. Now, remember, we want to add a number to the output. The output is a string, okay? But because we had to do numeric comparisons, guess is taken is an integer. So we use the string conversion function in order to convert that integer into a string so we can add it to this string and display it correctly. Okay. I just told you everything that it said except that it's going to read it to you in English again. And it didn't even show you the example input. Okay, well. Some of the things you can do. You remember how I said that breaks can sometimes make your code harder to rationalize about? This four guesses taken implies that we're going to give them six guesses, right? All right. <coughs> this break. It just sort of stops. Does it say like game over or something? No, it's just sort of like it just breaks out of this loop. And so like later down here, we've got to put a lot of logic around, did they get the right number? Did they not get the right number? What's another way that you could theoretically restructure this for loop? That would actually express whether or not you're leaving for one reason or another. We could put something about actually comparing the number to the secret number in the loop. Okay? Matter of fact, you could just say that it's for the guesses, and then instead of having this down here at the bottom, just slip that into the bottom. If you guess the right number, then you could basically say, wow, incorrect, and Guesses is under six. Okay. Under seven. Because you don't want to uh, give them just five guesses. But the point is, is that doing that, sometimes if you put these conditions into the loop, it makes it easier to understand later under what conditions you're supposed to be leaving this loop. So while you could leave the loop early through a break, it sometimes when this loop starts taking up this much of this screen, it's very easy to get these loops to expand very long. And these sort of exital, exiting uh, things can sometimes make your programs harder to maintain. Okay, so that's the guessing game. As they wrote it, with a hint on how you might rewrite it to maybe even make it a little bit more readable for later. So let's see if we can uh, recap this real quick, and then uh, we're, we're done for tonight. So why is it advantageous to have functions in our programs? Simplify code. Simplify code. 
What's that? Avoid duplication. Avoid duplication. Yep. Both of those are excellent reasons. Uh, when does the code in a function execute? When it's called. When it is called. All right. Uh, what keyword? Def. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a function and a function call? Exactly. A call is something that only exists at runtime. You can define the functions all you want, but they will not actually execute until they are called. How many global scopes are there in Python? One. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. How many local scopes are there? As many as you As many as you decide to create. Yes. Isn't there another scope that's just like for the current file? Uh, not in Python. I don't believe there is. Maybe that's JavaScript. What's the question? JavaScript. There is. is there a file scope? In is Python, there? I don't believe so. I think it's just global and, and local. I think there's a file scope. I don't know. I've never used it, but I thought Python only had two scopes. Evan, why don't you Google that while I continue through? What is a return value? It's the information passed back to the calling function. What the function resolves to. All right. I heard at least three correct answers and then three answers over each other, so I don't know. Um, basically, if you're thinking about like replacing the function with a value, that's what the return value is. If calling a function with a certain set of parameters means that it would return back a certain value, that's the return value. Okay, what keyword do we use to indicate a return value should be passed back to the call? Return. I know, it's terribly <laughs> circular. How can you force a variable in a function to refer to the global variable? Global. global keyword. If you don't have the global keyword, you have to rely on the global variable being used before or after the function. Before. Before, because otherwise the function will think that it is an undefined local variable. Can you set it without the global keyword? Can you set a global without the global keyword? <laughs> No, if you set it without the global keyword, then it'll actually set a local variable. Global keyword is what gives the function the idea that you're not looking inside the function. You're not creating a new variable within its scope. The global keyword will indicate that you're actually intending to manipulate it at a higher scope. So if you set it outside the scope of any function, is it not then in global scope? If you said not inside. Yeah, yeah. If you're not in a function, then worrying about how the function reaches outside of its scope doesn't matter because you'll never be in the function. So that variable would be a global variable. Yeah, yeah. So like if you had at the top level scope something like uh, age equals six, and you decide to set age to seven, there's no, there's only the global scope here. So there's no local scope to consider. All right, so none. It's the value that means nothing. 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 All right, what's its data type? None type. None type. Very good, we didn't even cover that. All right, uh, what does import all your pet's name? Yeah. All your name pet's Eric. name Eric. Eric statement do. Imports the module, are all your pets named Eric? Yes. It's a very poorly named module. It's probably an inside Monty Python joke that I don't know. I don't recognize it now. If they said I thought I knew about them all. dead parrots, I would have been spot on, you know? <laughs> all right, if you had a function named Bacon and the module name span. Wait a second, is this like a repeat? We already yeah, covered this. Yeah. Yeah. Exact one. Okay, skip it. How do you prevent a program from crashing when it gets an error? Include the try exception. Try exception, okay. 
What goes in the try clause? What do you want to try? <laughs> and that's typically wrapped in a looking for a word that starts with the letter B. What block? A block. <laughs> okay. What goes in the accept clause? How do you want to handle yeah, the exception? That you want to handle Which is typically the way that you handle it is typically wrapped in a a block. Okay. Except that the accept clause also has a name to allow you to reference the exception. So you'd say accept some name, and then that way you could use that exception inside that that handle and block by passes. Okay. We are going to skip the programming assignment because that'll give you something to do this evening or tomorrow. And thank you very much. So we'll pick up again, and we'll pick up on window. We'll pick up on lists. <coughs> So we're going to try to cover two, uh, two sections. So it might be you to read both lists and dictionaries and structuring data.